Hello and welcome to our Irish Studies Würzburg workshop with Dr. Alessandra Boller. I'd like to briefly introduce our guest for today. Dr. Alessandra Bolla is currently a postdoctoral researcher and lecturer in the Department of English Literary and Cultural Studies at the University of Siegen in Germany. She's a founding member and the coordinator of the Ephesus Center for Irish Studies at the University of Siegen. She's the author of one monograph entitled Rethinking the Human in Dystopian Times, which was published in 2018 and the co-editor of two collective volumes, one of them entitled Dystopia Science Fiction Post-Apocalypse, published in 2016 with Eckhart Foix, and Canadian Ecologies Beyond Environmentalism, published in 2020 with Martin Küster and Angela Crivani. Dr. Boller has published widely on her different research interests, which include feminist and new materialist approaches um, to speculative fiction, as well as, and this interests us most today, Irish literature since 1900. She is currently especially interested in Irish short, short fiction, which will also be of particular interest um, for us today. And there she particularly focuses on narratives on community and short narratives published in early 19th century magazines. Her articles and book chapters on Irish literature have been published in, for instance, Journal of the Short Story in English, Estudios Irlandeses, Interferences Literaire, my French, pardon my French, or Silence and Modern Irish Literature. Two other articles will soon be published in an upcoming volume of Irish Studies in Europe and a special issue of the Open Library of the Humanities. So as you can tell from what I've just said, Dr. Bolla is one of the most knowledgeable colleagues in the field of Irish short fiction. So I am, along with you all, looking forward to learn a lot from her today in this workshop, which is entitled Strange Encounters Irish short fiction, the experience of migration, and impossible or possible communities. Dr. Bolla, we are very much looking forward to hearing from you about and working with you on texts by Melato Uchi Ukori and Emma Danio. The online stage is yours. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and also for the invitation. And yeah, I'm Actually, also looking forward to working with you all today. Um, let me share my screen so that you can see the presentation I prepared. All right, I hope you can see um, my presentation now. Perfect. Looks good. Thank you. Right. Okay. So, um, well, you can see my title here again. Um, before we read into the topic of our workshop today, I'd like to provide you with some background information and food for thought. So my recent work investigates the notion of uh, community as contemplated in Irish short fiction and proceeding from the idea of narrative of community. I have recently focused on the polyphonic renegotiation of identities in and through short fiction, short fiction that engages with personal and with national crises since the Celtic Tiger period. And I think the spectral presence of the past and especially the motive of migration or forced migration uh, that was so central to Irish experience, I think this really provides an interesting lens through which uh, the community in an increasingly multi-ethnic Irish and global society can be discussed. So, Following Jacques Rancière's work on political aesthetics, I have recently argued that short fiction engages with dominant discourses and that it can provide counter discourses. So my most current project pays particular attention to how the increasing visibility of African Irish um, women writers can play a vital role in the attempt to open up the canon of Irish literature and thus also to alter the politics of representation. And so this means how we view the world, who is seen, who is heard, who's granted a voice and presence at the center of society. 
Um, so today's workshop is related to this last project, as you can see, um, well, here's our agenda for today. Um, so after an introduction to the topic and field, which will hopefully establish a foundation for our discussion, we'll probably start off with a little activity and we'll then use this simply as a form of warm up because I, well, as I've said, I really want to work with you on this important topic. Um, I'll then provide some input and introduce Ron's theories and ethics concepts, um, strange encounters and the distribution of the sensible. And they shall help us discuss representation and acts of subjectivization in and through short fiction and light writing. So I'll try to make this talk as well somewhat interactive and that's what rely on you well, not to fall asleep, please. Okay. Um, and if you have questions in between or if anything's not really working, um, please do let me know, okay? So you can simply open your microphones and uh, ask questions. Yeah, if I don't see the Zoom hand or that your real hand that you may raise, yeah? So you simply open the microphones and let me know. Okay, so then third part of the workshop, we'll discuss the text that, um, yeah, you got. So by Irish-Canadian author Emma Donoghue and Irish-Nigerian writer Milatu Uchi Okori. Both of them write about migration as experienced by migrants and by the uh, communities that migrants leave, leave behind or try to enter. And well, as you all know, uh, Donahue's and uh, Okori's biographically or autobiographically tended short stories uh, were accompanied by short essays, which comment on these topics from the writer's own perspectives as a migrant or asylum seeker. So reading these texts through the lenses um, that I'll introduce in the second part here, we will then try to find out how strange encounters in short fiction and accompanying examples of live writing can give rise to the possibility of recognition in new communities based on shared experience. Um, so, and well, I'm quoting from one of Professor Bergman's publications here, uh, since positionality as a specific form of relationality foregrounds the situation, situatedness of an individual within a society's ideological matrix, questions of identity and society will, play, will play an important role as well. So we'll take a look at some recent developments in Irish society and politics as well. We won't focus that much on life writing today, but well, most of you are experts on this form already, and maybe you know much more about it than I do. So we'll only briefly focus on this aspect before our eventual discussion of Donahue's and the Corey's text. So um, here are the aims that we'll hopefully attain today. Yeah, so the first one here, uh, participa participants have gained an idea of how encounters in a new politics of representation, which basically is the distribution of the sensible, can decenter whiteness and contribute to more inclusive community building. And the second one, by reading Donahue's and the Corey's stories and essays through the lens of Ahmed and Rossier's concepts, uh, they can discuss how strange encounters through short fiction and forms of life writing can give rise to subjectivization, recognition, and new communities based on shared experience. Right, so if we want to achieve these aims, we should get going. And um, yeah, if you have read the description of this workshop, you've already heard about calls for decentering whiteness that have become increasingly loud in Irish media and culture, as well as in academia today. So this development may seem a bit surprising when we consider that in the late 1980s, aspects of Irish life and identity were still framed in terms of blackness in Roddy Doyle's novel, The Commitments and its film adaptation, for instance. And in this film and novel, uh, Jimmy Rabbit's a uh, young man from working class Dublin forms a soul band. And just to give you an idea of the discourse of blackness in the late 1980s, I'd like to show you a short clip and I invite you to comment on it afterwards. Yeah, so it's a very short one. Um, just listen closely, pay close attention. And yeah, I'm just interested in your reactions afterwards. That's what you've got to measure up to, lads. Do you not think, uh, what? Well, like, maybe we're a little white for that kind of thing. Do you not get it, lads? The Irish are the blacks of Europe, and Dubliners are the blacks of Ireland, and the Northside Dubliners are the blacks of Dublin. 
So say it once, say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. Right, okay, so I'll show you the um, presentation again. And in the meantime, you can simply think about well, what you've just seen, your impression of that. Um, so why should uh, Jimmy, uh, this well, white lad from, from well, the north side of Dublin, actually say, well, I'm black and I'm proud. So I'm just interested in your uh, reaction. And here you can still see um, what the script from the novel. Yeah, so in the novel, the word black is not used, the different words used, which I won't repeat here. Uh, but yeah, I want to show you um, this excerpt from the novel as well. Right, so do you have any ideas or reactions um, regarding this short video clip? So, does anybody know or have an idea why these lads would, lads would identify with black musicians and James Brown in particular? Now I'm black and I'm proud. Does that make any sense? Yeah, so please just open your microphone. I can see a hand here. Hi, sorry. Um, my name's uh, Victoria. I think so. Um, I've thought about that um, clip quite a lot. Um, I, I used to love. I actually still do uh, love that um, film. Um, and about the clip for me, that often I've always thought about that in terms of of Ireland positioning themselves in a in the sort of post colonial discourse um, as a as a, um, a, a colony or former colony of of the of, of Britain. And I think it's it's. I've always um understood it in that context as well um a way of of looking at themselves and the way they've positioned themselves yeah thank you very much yeah so uh of course i do love the film as well so this was one of the reasons why i wanted to show you a clip but it really fits right so uh you mentioned post-colonial discourse uh the former position as a colony for instance right um are there any more reactions um if not that's fine as well just have to warm up a little. Um, okay, right. So I just brought um, yeah a longer quote from an article by Charlotte McIver that very summarizes um, this idea quite well, I think, um, because she says that um, against the backdrop of well, ongoing poverty in the Republic of Ireland, the troubles in the north. Um, this statement yeah, in the film and the novel had a very particular uh, resonance yeah, because it captured the idea of the confused ethnic identity of the Irish. And she mentioned some examples here, such as uh, Black Irish, Paddies, um, slurs against the Irish that recall a colonial history, a history of violence uh, that positioned the Irish as an inferior race vis-a-vis -vis the British. And you still find very racist um, cartoons, for instance, yeah, that show how the Irish were perceived at the time, um, yeah, or colon or colonial times. Yeah. So the contradictions and immediate emotional appeal, Charlotte MacGyver writes, uh, contained within Jimmy Rivers' assertion indexes an Irish history of engagement with race, ethnicity, and power that is far from simple. Yeah. So um, such cultural depictions highlight how Blackness is a frame of mind and a pattern of thought, yeah, and that's not necessarily tied to skin color. And so is whiteness, yeah, which only became an integral pattern of hegemonic discourse during the Celtic Tiger period. And well, let's make sure that everybody's on the same page. So what was the Celtic Tiger? So what does this term actually um, yeah, describe? Does anybody know? Yeah, uh, Frank Leitner. Um, yeah, so the, the term Celtic Tiger uh, refers to the economic boom Ireland experienced. I mean, for a very long time, the, the economy in Ireland was not very strong, but in the 1990s, it uh, 
seemed to to pick up steam in a way and uh, um, became very successful, um, surprisingly successful even. And there, yeah, there was a um, an economic boom in the in the country, and it ended then with the financial crisis in two thousand and eight. Yes, thank you very much for this um, very concise, uh, well-priced introduction to the Celtic Tiger. That was great. Thank you. So, yeah, um, right. So, in the economic boom uh, in the Republic of Ireland, roughly between 1995 and 2008, um, a period of rapid uh, economic growth, um, a rupture, a turning point, uh, yeah, in Irish history, actually, um, from a very poor nation to wealth, at least this is what people thought at the time, that they were suddenly very wealthy, very modern, and all this was stopped uh, very suddenly uh, by the world financial crisis. And well, then the Celtic tiger only used to be a tiger, it wasn't a tiger anymore. Uh, so Ireland was basically thrown back upon well, itself and its history. And this is so important because um, the Celtic Tiger gave Ireland the idea that they were moving towards a more global and more modern identity, that Ireland was being transformed at the time. So the Celtic Tiger was more than a boom, an economic boom. It was also a signifier, a signifier that came to be understood as the culmination of or escape from Irish history, as Jason Buchanan termed it. Um, so at the time, whiteness was established as a particular frame, hegemonic frame, and well, Ireland became an immigration country. And I put quotation marks, uh, question marks here, because this is, of course, a simplified idea. Yeah, so we have to be careful to some extent, but this is the, the trend, basically, that we um, can witness at the time. Um, and what it also brought uh, with it, so with the idea of an escape from history could be termed amnesia of experience of oppression. And I'm using Krista de Bruyne's term here. And we could also talk about the amnesia of experience of emigration, you know, because Ireland was an emigration country for a very long time, but um, for a short, very short while, people seem to forget about that. You know? And Ireland was suddenly so um, successful. So let us take a look at some numbers here, yeah, immigration and immigration rates. So I just want to give you uh, a minute to take a look at this figure here, and then I would like to know what you can see. So maybe you can then simply describe what you can see in this figure. Right, so we can start with very simple things. So you don't have to analyze uh, the figure, but maybe you can simply describe what you can see here. So what does this figure show? Any ideas? Yeah. Dominic yeah. Um, well, basically, the uh, chart shows um, the number of people who migrated into or out of uh, Ireland um, over the time. And um, we have basically three graphs um, the emigration graph, the immigration graph, and then um, the net migration graph that is basically an addition of both the uh, emigration and immigration uh, graph. And we can see um, when the emigration rate is higher than the uh, immigration, then we have a loss of populace from migration in Ireland. And uh, at in 1995, when the immigration starts to um, go over the emigration, then we have um, a rise in populace through migration in Ireland. 
Yes, great. Thank you for, well, this was more than a description for the analysis of, um, yeah, these, um, oh, this figure here. Right. So thank you very much. So what we can see here, of course, is that um, this, this figure only shows us the time span between the late 80s and 2008, yeah, so when the um, financial crisis hit Ireland. Um, and we can see that migration to Ireland was not invented at the time. But um, the development of net migration is quite interesting because it became positive for the first time in the early 90s. Yeah. So, and as we've just heard, net migration basically means, um, well, or positive net migration means that more people um, immigrate to Ireland than the people, well, than people leave Ireland, right? So, this is what positive net migration means. And it, yeah, first becomes positive in the 90s. Um, Returning Irish people and immigrants from EU countries are also included uh, in the statistics here, but um, generally speaking, we could also see drastic increases in the number of asylum seekers. Um, and it's here that I would like to very briefly turn to the short stories or the text that uh, you were supposed to read for today, just to get us going. So, can you spot both immigration and emigration as topics or themes in the text that I asked you to read for today? Let's briefly collect some ideas just to connect um, well, on this historical information to the stories you were asked to read. In the short story, Counting the Days, um, the protagonist leaves Ireland, so there's an um, emigration and they immigrate into America. Yeah, thank you, right, counting the days. So migration from uh, Ireland to Canada. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Yeah, any further ideas? There's a, a text by Paula, I think it's Paula Stark probably. She says, in the hostile life, people that immigrated into Ireland are in the main focus. Yeah, thank you. That's right. Yeah, so um, in, the, in the whole book, yeah, so we have three short stories. And in Under the Awning, uh, we have the perspective of one uh, immigrant, but in the other stories, especially in the hostel life, we actually read about the stories of many um, asylum seekers. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else that comes to your mind when you think about um, the texts, so the, the short stories, but also uh, the short essays um, that well, relates to immigration or emigration? Yes, feel free to use the chat. Oh, and we have another hand here. Yes, please. Yeah, so the um, essays kind of showed that both authors of both these short stories tried to mirror their own experiences in the texts they wrote. So um, one of them emigrated herself to Canada and the other immigrated herself to Ireland. Yes, right. So we have a fictional a presentation of immigration and emigration, but also uh, what well, aspect of life writing here, yeah, authors who migrated yeah, from Ireland to Canada and from Nigeria to Ireland. Right, so please simply keep in mind these texts when we talk about identity, when we talk about the concept, so maybe you can directly uh, connect the uh, theoretical aspects with the stories and the essays that you read. Okay. Right, so during the time of the Celtic Tiger, Ireland became an um, undeniably multi-ethnic country, but the democratic shift was not easily embraced, we can say, uh, despite the fact that the experience of migration has been so central to the imagination of the Irish imagined community. And we'll take this aspect as a point of departure to reflect on different responses triggered by multi-ethnicity, um, especially analyzing attempts to maintain a certain normative idea of Irishness as whiteness. 
um, and as basis of communities. So such developments prompt questions about the recognition of shared experiences and the visibility of refugees in Irish society and culture in particular. So today, 15 years after the end of the Celtic Tiger, uh, there are many controversial debates going on about racism in Ireland and about institutions that fuel segregation and racism. Direct provision is often considered such an institution or system. And I have another question for you. Can anybody tell us what direct provision is or what this means? So what is direct provision? Do you have any idea? And I don't need a perfect definition. Some ideas uh, suffice. Yeah, Franka. Um, I think direct provision is the system in Ireland or, yeah, that provides for refugees and asylum seekers. So it kind of provides uh, not really houses, because in many ways there aren't even houses, I think. Sometimes it's just containers uh, or something like that. Um, but yeah, basically the system that provides for them. And I think it's not, it doesn't belong to the state, but it's a private um, company or something like that. If I remember correctly, I'm, I'm not so sure anymore. Yes, thank you. Um, so by definition, and here you can see um, an excerpt from this hostel live by, uh, from the essay by um, Okori. And by definition, direct provision is the name that is used to describe, this is the quote you can see here, used to describe the accommodation, food, money, medical services you get while your international protection application is being assessed or while you're an asylum seeker, which means the same thing. So this is from the information page um, on the website. So as you said, well, um, asylum seekers are provided with accommodation, for instance. They are provided, directly provided with food with a little bit of money and medical services. Yeah? And Okori here, Thinks about home, yeah. So is this really home? It shouldn't be home, right? She talks about the waiting that you have to endure, um, and yeah, that uh, you only get a weekly payment of at that time twenty-one euros. It's a bit more now, um, and well, everything is basically structured, provided for. Um, by this institution, yeah. But asylum seekers are thus not allowed to work. They are not allowed to choose where to live. They do not any have any freedom of choice, yeah? and um, they often stay in in hostels. And there are often private companies at least involved in direct provision. For instance, uh, uh, caterers, yeah, who uh, prepare the food and that. So a lot of money is actually made uh, with direct provision with the system. Um, Right. And even though people shouldn't be staying for longer than a couple of months in direct provision, uh, many asylum seekers had to live in direct provision for many, many years. Amilata Uchi Okori is one of these people, as you read, as you read in her introductory essay to this hostel life. Um, and complaints against the system have been issued, campaigns have been started, and there's really much resistance from the social and cultural sector. And currently, there are plans to replace the system. Let's see how this will actually turn out. And I'll talk a bit more about this um, publication here later on. This is a publication by a campaign that is called Abolish Direct Provision, very telling name, I think. Um, and we we'll talk a bit more about the, this later. Right, so let me wrap up this uh, introductory part here. Um, so we know that Ireland traditionally was an immigration country, uh, but still its society has never been homogeneously white, uh, speaking, speaking in a metaphorical and a literal way. So its multi-ethnicity, however, only became undeniably visible and acknowledged in the late 1990s. Uh, today, African Irish writers, for example, play an increasingly important role in the cultural and literary life of Ireland. Uh, but the success of authors such as Milad Uchi Okori or of spoken word performer Feli Speaks, and I can only um, tell you, check her out, Feli Speaks, she's just great. Uh, so the success of such authors and um, artists can hardly veil the limited access to mainstream publishing that African-Irish creative artists did experience, for instance. 
So their fascinating work is in itself worth paying attention to, but it also makes the case for the expansion of possibilities of representation. And this also includes the necessity to listen to other voices, to grant refugees, asylum seekers, and regular uh, immigrants um, a voice. Right, so, so much for the first part. Um, do you have questions or would you like to comment on anything? Has anything not become clear? So this was only designed to be a bit, well, food for thought, basically, but feel free to ask questions if you have any. That doesn't seem to be the case. Okay. Right, so to get this properly started, uh, I brought in another video. And what I want to show you is the trailer of an installation opera. And this is an adaptation of, of course, uh, This Hostel Life. And before I show you um, this video clip, uh, I'd like to ask if anybody could briefly remind us about the genre and the form of This Hostel Life. So what do we need to know? What do we need to keep in mind about Corey's book? What are the most important basic facts to remember about This Hostel Life? And what do we encounter in this book? So what does it yeah, consist of? Yes, please. <laughs> so it consists of um, three stories um, and an introductory part. And we we read um, one of the stories and um, the this autobiographical introduction. Uh, Frau Raab wanted to add something. Um, yeah, what you said basically, and that there's um, just another um, part. I don't unfortunately don't remember the author right now, but um, just a little part at the end where it talks about the more. Um, actual basic facts about how the immigration um, island is um, dealt with, dealt with right now. So I have a little political background from Bailiam Thornton. There we go. Yes, perfect. Uh, thank you so much. Right. So we have an introductory essay, rather personal one. Then we have this uh, academic essay that provides information on direct provision by Liam Thornton and three different short stories yeah um so seems to be quite difficult to turn three different short stories a personal load and an informative essay into an opera isn't it um so let's just see how they try to do that so and while watching the trailer please think about what the team wanted to achieve how they wanted to do that and what effect this opera may have on the audience yeah um I can also post the uh, questions to the chat. It's a video of about three and a half or four minutes. Um, um, yeah, please simply take notes so that we can discuss this afterwards. So the questions are in the chat. Um, I just hope that this video will work as well. This is an unusual type of opera. We're calling it an installation opera because essentially there's four different things happening at different places around the crypt in Christchurch Cathedral, which is an amazing space. I first went in there many years ago and immediately I thought, I've got to do something here, something operatic. The original idea was that we showcase the talents of the opera INO studio singers and I knew immediately that I wanted to create a claustrophobic encounter. So I wanted, you know, if possible, to offer to the audience an experience, an immersive experience. 
Well, the book is just three of my short stories. One of the stories is based in a um, direct provision setting, which was where I was for eight and a half years when I first arrived into Ireland. Actually, Evangelia and um, the Fegus in INO called me and um, I had a meeting with them and they said they were interested in using this an opera. I felt that that would bring a whole new kind of audience, you know, introduce them to the book as well. And um, yeah, I was happy, you know. It's, I, I think that, you know, the focus has been on um, direct provision as a place, as opposed to our behaviour as a people, as a society. And I hope that that would be where the attention would go to. How do we, by the things our thinking and the way we act and the way we speak, how do we encourage that type of institu institutionalization? And I hope that that would be the discussion that would be hard. I thought the venue made it very evocative and haunting. And I think it's, it's a very good expression of the difficulty for people being in direct provision. A lot of mixed emotions, because direct provision is something a lot of people don't talk about or know, you know, about. So um, I would say personally, it, it was very touching. I thought it was pretty incredible. I have never really experienced anything like it before. Um, so it was really kind of interesting to be experiencing one thing here and then just hearing a little bit somewhere else and saying maybe actually I want to check out what's happening there. And the fact that like at times the singers were like walking around as well that kind of and you had to kind of get out of their way and uh, everybody was kind of searching and on a journey. So while we love doing big projects in the board gosh energy theatre like La Cenerentola or Madame Butterfly it's important that we also have projects in different scales it's about having a very intimate experience and a challenging uh, and hopefully will cause you to think differently about opera and and about our society in general I'll just give you a couple of seconds to think about this, to think about what you've just seen and heard, um, and then we'll try to talk a bit about what they actually wanted to achieve and yeah, what do you think um, about the possible effect that such an opera could have um, on the audience. Okay, so let us just start with the question, what did they want to achieve? Yeah, uh, Teresa Keller. Um, <clears throat> the author said that the goal is to spark a discussion about the direct provision, what it means to the people who are in direct provision and show that to the people to spark a discussion and um yeah yes great right to start a discussion um yeah perfect what else uh what else did you notice what did they want to achieve how did they want to do that uh, Anna Hada. i think they used opera because they wanted to reach another audience Yes, perfect. This is what Okori herself said, right? So to bring a different audience to the book. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah, uh, Dominic Klaus. Um, they also wanted to recreate this feeling of uh, being in such a, um, uh, being someone who uh, receives direct, uh, direct provision by having these uh, performances at the same time at different locations. So the people um, also said they kind of felt a bit lost and um, had to go around and everyone was wandering and um, not really settled in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she said that um, this, this one guest said everybody's on a journey here, you know, trying to get out of the way of uh, another person here. Yeah, um, Elisa Raab. Um, I also found it really interesting how they were actually trying to um, construct a claustrophobic environment so um just really 
pushing on the emotional to emotional response of the um, audience, which I thought was a really interesting way to get the point across or um, grab attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the um, claustrophobic atmosphere, the immersive experience, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we have a remark from Paula in the chat, and she says, in the end, the director, I'm not sure if he was director, <laughs> the director, but the man that talked in the end, I think he, he was the opera um, person, probably the director, right? Um, it, he said um, he wanted to have people look at opera in a different way, uh, Paula says, so maybe not as the classic opera one would expect. Yes, right. Thank you so much uh, to all of you. Good point. Yeah, so... Uh, the notion of the installation opera, the form of the installation opera, um, was used to create an immersive experience uh, to bring a new audience to the book. And I guess I'll share my screen here in just a second. Um, there we go. Um, yeah, and uh, I think there was one very important aspect that Okori mentioned, because she said that we've always focused on direct provision as a place. And she wanted to shift the focus to the behavior of society. Yeah? So how do people speak, act, or think? How do they treat uh, asylum seekers? Yeah? So that this institution of direct provision is still in operation. Yeah? So she really wanted to shift the focus. Uh, she wanted people to think differently. Right, so um, thank you very much for all your ideas. So let us just keep all this in mind when we talk about uh, reactions to immigration and about encounters. Yeah, because this is also what uh, they stressed here, the notion of encounter. Um, and it's here that I would like to turn to um, the concept that I want to talk about today. Um, and I'd like to start with Sarah Ahmed's idea of strange encounters. And she begins her study with a reflection on the figure of the stranger and discourses related to the figure. Yes, and all the quotations that you can see here are taken from this book, yes, Strange Encounters. So Sarah Ahmed here identifies the discourse of well, stranger danger, she calls it. Yeah? So, and this says that some people simply are strangers and pose dangers. Yeah? And she says that this idea is really misleading because strangers are produced when we expel certain bodies yeah, from the center of society. And thereby we do not only demarcate spaces of belonging, but we also produce the stranger. We produce the stranger as an other and as, well, a danger. And the other form of discourse that she identifies is the notion of welcome, of entirely positive evaluations of multiculturalism. And some scholars in the field go as far as saying that we are all strangers sometimes, no matter if we are migrants or refugees or tourists. And this holds true to some extent, of course, but Ahmed also challenges this idea. She says that this thought that we are all strangers uh, conceals differences, differences between forms of displacement, differences between historical or social conditions of such displacement, for instance. And I think it definitely makes a difference um, when you're seen as a stranger because you seek asylum somewhere, or if you migrate to a country because you've been offered a top position in the company, for instance. Yeah? So there is a difference between forms of displacement, forms of journeys. So Ahmed then argues that we should not ontologize the stranger. And that means that we shouldn't turn the figure into uh, the figure of the stranger into a being that simply, simply is. Yeah? Because th those ideas would conceal history, discourses, social relations. According to her, we should rather focus um, on how the stranger is a figure that is produced by such discourses and how, and I quote her, the stranger is an effect of processes of inclusion and exclusion. Now, this is what she says. So this is important for us today um, because we want to think about how bodies are produced as strangers and how the, such bodies can be encountered. Yeah? Because we need to understand how identity is established through strange encounters because we need to acknowledge differences and political processes. And you may here already think about Okori's underviewing and how certain bodies are constructed as other or as strangers in this short story. Yeah, um, where we can, again, just collect some early ideas. Yeah? Um, so do we encounter 
strangers in this short story? Um, and if so, how are these strangers produced in the short story? So what can you find here? Maybe also thinking about racism, thinking about exclusion, marginalization. Yeah, just think about it for a couple of seconds and then let us collect just some very basic ideas. All right, do you remember anything that relates to this idea of the stranger from your reading of Okori's short story? Yeah, uh, Dominic Haus. Um, well, in uh, Okori's short story, um, in the short story herself, she uh, anonym, uh, used anonymous characters, and um, that's a thing uh, the other students criticized about the short story, but the other students are also just uh, numbered from uh, A to G, I believe so, um, they are also strangers, they don't have a face in the short story itself. Yes, thank you, right, so we have the, the frame story and the embedded story, and in the frame story, um, the uh, Irish characters only have letters instead of names. And in the embedded story, uh, there's the anonymous um, yeah, protagonist. Mm -hmm. Very good observation, thank you. Yeah, further ideas about what strangers, racism, marginalization, anything uh, that you noticed. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we have two hands here. I know who's first. Three, okay. Whoever wants to start. And then I'll just quickly start. Um, in the short story, racism also plays quite a big role as it's described that um, the character gets weird looks on the bosses and is generally ostracized. And I think it's also mentioned that um, kids next door call her Blackie. So racism plays a large part in that story. Yeah, thank you for reminding us of these examples. Mm -hmm. So racism looks and words. Yeah, I think the next one was uh, Elisa Raab. Um, and I thought of the protagonist in the embedded story to be the, the stranger, but then also the author of the embedded story in the short story to be a stranger because um, just the way um, their um, experiences are shared within the story and then how the story is received by the other so they can really understand the point she's trying to make and how she's trying to make that point and so she feels well i don't know how she feels but um yeah that's how why i um also kind of um, explained her, her as being a stranger as well yeah so the doubling of this experience yeah in the frame and the embedded story very good point thank you uh yeah teresa Kella. uh i i wanted to say quite a similar thing um, if you look at the frame story, um, she comes into a room in her class and she knows the leader. And I guess she knows her classmates too. So they are technically not strangers, but on an emotional level, they are kind of strangers because the others can't um, really understand her experience and why she um, and, and how she um, talked about her experience in her short story. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So the emotional dimension, the experience, that's very important here. Yeah. So uh, the, the perspe perception or the experience of the author is also questioned here. Yeah. So this is all about marginal marginalization. Um, but also within the uh, embedded story, yeah, we have lots of ideas that relate to the notion of strangers, marginalization, insults, um, the mother who's not a manager anymore, but stuck in shelves in the supermarket, um, the reflection on who counts as Irish, who can be Irish, yeah, um, and so on and so on. So you can see that we can really read this short story through the lens of, well, discourse of strangers, yeah, stranger danger, but also 
uh, multiculturalism, yeah, well, effects of processes of exclusion mostly, and so on, yeah. Yeah, thank you for uh, sharing your ideas and your associations here. Um, before I continue, uh, do you have questions about this? Yeah, about how Ahmed identifies the two discourses, the welcome discourse and stranger danger, and um, yeah, how she challenges it because uh, she says, well, the stranger is produced actually by our processes. So that's the gist of it. Uh, any questions about that? No? Okay, right. Um, okay, so then according to Ahmed, encounters yeah, can shift boundaries of what is familiar. Encounters can transform conditions. Um, so let's keep this in mind, although we're going to leave Ahmed's argument for a moment to think about how even encounters are shaped by political processes. Um, we'll take a look at Jacques Rossier's concept of the distribution of the sensible now. And for those of you who are not familiar with Rossier's work, I try to draw a simplified model to illustrate and set into relation the terms that I'm using today, because Rossier actually redefines certain concepts and uses um, neologisms. And don't be overwhelmed. Um, we'll simply focus uh, on how bodies are visible and considered voices and citizens, according to Rossier. Yeah, and I'll um, point out the most important uh, aspect step by step, and we'll try to provide um, examples. But if you have questions, feel free to ask questions. All right. So what you can see here is the division between the organizational system of order on the left hand side, policy, police, uh, police, and the process of emancipation as its counterpart here on the right hand side. So the policy of police presents the law and a form of governing. governing. And the counterpart of the law um, of the police is equality and democracy. And this marks a point of departure, not a goal for us here. And this realm of equality or democracy is the realm of um, the demos, the people without power, the people without entitlement. So politics for us here means a process, a counteraction against the law that determines who or what is visible and audible at the center of society. And this is um, the power of the police or policy, the distribution of the sensible, as you can see in the middle, uh, which is established via aesthetics. And aesthetics here means the capacity to perceive something and to make sense of it. Yeah? So this distribution of the sensible defines what or who is perceptible, uh, what or who is visible and audible, yeah, and who is therefore also well recognizable as a subject. Yeah? If you're not visible, if you're not audible, if you don't have a face, you're not um, recognized as a subject. Yeah? So this is one of the points he, he makes here. So Ostia understands aesthetics as the horizon of what is sayable and what is audible. So what can be perceived? The distribution of the sensible for him thus is a system, a system of apparently self-evident facts of perception and of forms of inclusion and exclusion. And it thus also a way of framing a community's common sphere of experience, ties in with the sharing of a common capacity. So in a very, very simplified way, we can draw a connection um, to what is conceived as normal or as the norm. Yeah. So think about uh, whiteness again. Yeah. So who is perceived? How are people perceived? What's the frame of reference, reference here? So although what I've just explained about pol policy my, may directly evoke ideas of totalitarian states, we do not have to relate Rossier's ideas to what is commonly understood as political realm only. But um, his ideas actually also apply to everyday discourse, to understandings uh, of normality. As I've said, for him, aesthetics about, is about the capacity to perceive something or somebody. So speech is important here, for instance. Rossier explains the importance of speech by elaborating on a worker's strike. So as long as the worker's demands are understood 
as inarticulate complaints, um, they are excluded from the realm of coherent speech and they are excluded from political debates. So we don't listen to those who are branded as fanatics uttering inarticulate, indistinct or wild complaints. Can you think of an example here maybe from everyday life? So a group whose voices are rather classified as inarticulate, as indistinct, as well, not reasonable. Is there well any example that comes to you to mind from well current debates, the media, culture, politics? Who could be classified as such um, well, inarticulate voices? No ideas? No? Okay, no problem. So then I'll try to explain this by using a well, rather simple example that hopefully all of you can relate to. Um, because you could think of women. Uh, for a long time, the idea of hysteria was used to classify women's voices as shrill, shrill sounds of madness. Yeah. So uh, when you think about, well, the distribution of the sensible as, well, patriarchal society, for instance, and uh, the realm of the demos, yeah, um, well, women starting here, um, women were not really perceived as subjects, 19th century and even uh, later, um, they were not perceived as, well, making sense, but as, well, hysterical uh, women with shrill voices, yeah, they were not really uh, featured or were not really visible, audio, audible at the center, center of society, yeah, and why, uh, um, well, interrupting these ideas, calling into question such ideas, such ideas with the help of, well, feminist movements, for instance, women were able to move into the center, yeah? So um, there's still people talking about hysterical women, but this is not the dominant discourse anymore, right? So um, I still happened in Germany in the um, well, 80s, I think, yeah? Um, that uh, female politicians were laughed about, not taken seriously. So it took a long way into the center um, for women with the help of feminism, for instance, uh, yeah, to become subject, to become visible, to become audible. Yeah? So this is what um, this distribution and the struggle for emancipation uh, is all about here, yeah, using uh, this model by Ross here. Um, we could nowadays maybe also think about um, how activists are called climate terrorists. Yeah? Um, so very controversial topic, I know. But this branding of activists as terrorists also is part of that. They are not allowed into the center of debate. Yeah? I hope these ideas make it a bit more graspable, more understandable. Yeah? Um, and again, feel free to ask questions. Right? So um, just continue here in the next part, and I'll relate that to Okori in a second. Um, so once again about this distribution of the sensible. Uh, another definition here by Lane, who stresses that with the distribution of the sensible, the police imposes a matrix of perception and feeling that defines which social groups are visible and which are invisible, which are assumed to possess the capacity for rational speech and which um, are assumed to be merely able to express inarticulate complaint. I'll say women in that well, idea would does not count as people employing the capacity for rational speech. They are just emotional, unreasonable, and hysterical. Yeah, and it does not allow to um, take part in debates. Yeah, so just to use this example again. Um, so this is very much about audibility, voices that are heard, but also about visibility. Yeah? And in the essay that is included. In this hostile life that you mentioned earlier today, Liam Thornton writes, Okori's work shines the light onto issues that for far too long have been swept under the carpet. Our society's ability to condemn, institutionalize, and castigate persons due to differences is ever present in 2018. 
Um, Ireland for generations has been a country of emigration. The experience of the migrant has been told in word, in word, and so on. So you can see that it's very much about perception, right? To shine the light on something that has been swept under the carpet, something that has been hidden from view. Yeah? Um, so this is what, what aesthetics means for us here. Yeah? Yeah? What is um, visible, what is audible. Yeah? And in contrast to well, the hidden experience is the experience of the Irish migrant, which has been told in many, many ways before. Yeah? So it's very much about who or what is perceived, who or what is visible or audible. You know? And we can relate this to a question that Lucy Caldwell asked in her introduction to um, a great short story collection or anthology, New Irish Short Stories, yeah, being various, what makes a writer Irish? You know? It's the question that has innovated and energized me for the whole of my writing life, Lucy Caldwell life. So the question of who's Visible, the question of who's audible is very much related to questions of identity, questions of Irishness. Yeah. So um, let us try to apply this model to different dimensions of Irish life and culture by returning to the constitution of Irish identity in times of immigration. And just to give you again a bit of background information. Uh, there are cognitive and affective dimensions of national identity, but also normative ones, um, right argues here. So um, he identifies two distinct definitions of nationhood, an ethnic one and a civic one. And the civic definition emphasizes more inclusive factors such as citizenship and respect for institution and values. So this would um, make uh, citizenship more inclusive. And then there is a more exclusive definition and this is the ethnic definition. Yeah. Um, does anybody by chance know who is granted Irish citizenship today and if it's easy to become an Irish citizen nowadays? Oh, yeah. So we have a hand here. Can see who that is? I don't know how it is for people who <clears throat> don't have any Irish heritage. But um, as far as I know, one is granted Irish citizenship when at least one of your parents is Irish in the sense that um, they have full Irish citizenship. And then there's also a rule where I'm not 100% certain anymore how it was about when your one of your parents is Irish but wasn't born in Ireland or two Irish parents. Um, and also um, it plays a part if only one of your parents is Irish, whether your parents were married at the point that they had you. Yes, thank you very much. Right. So when we look into the details, it becomes rather difficult, but uh, we can also keep it simple for the moment, saying that, um, well, ancestry is important. Yeah, so there is an ethnic definition of Irishness, Irish citizenship right now, or at least since the 2004 citizenship referendum. Yeah, and in this referendum, 79% of the Irish voted in favor of a definition of citizenship determined by ancestry. Yeah, so this is the ethnic definition of nationhood. So when a child is now born in Ireland, um, to parents who are not Irish, but who have been living there for a very long time, uh, this child doesn't get the Irish citizenship, not anymore. It was different before that. Yeah. Um, so this is one aspect that we have to take into consideration here, a more restrictive, a more exclusive sense of citizenship. And the direct provision system in turn can be seen as a structure that also potentially cordons off immigrants from participation in society. Yeah. And this is a topic that has been addressed by writers such as Okori or uh, by Ifedin Madimbo. And the scholar Martin Rees um, argued that the direct provision system actually does not provide safety from the stranger danger yeah, that Ahmed identified, identified. But this system actually enforces criminalization, poverty, and strangeness of African Irish bodies. You know, think about what Okori said in the video we watched earlier about uh, the opera adaptation, you know, when she said that the focus was always on direct provision as a place, but not on society's behavior towards people living in direct provision. Yeah? So they are not allowed to work, they're not allowed um, 
uh, to choose where they want to live. And well, we can directly see, I think, how this could fuel criminal criminal criminalization of poverty, for instance. Yeah, and the segregation causes strangeness. Yeah, this is a process of exclusion, a constructing of producing the strange. So the established um, distribution of the center in Ireland today then centers on whiteness as the norm, yeah? um, since the Celtic tiger well, mostly, and it is structured and maintained by spatial segregation, yeah? things like the direct provision, and well, aspect of the now nationalism, racism on an everyday basis. Yeah? Think about the short story under the awning, how um, in the embedded story, the protagonist is called Blacky, for instance, or uh, how people actually look at her, yeah, look at her, how they call her, again, has to do with aesthetic, how we perceive something or somebody, yeah. And um, this basically means that African asylum seekers are still often produced as strangers by spatial segregation, by discourse, by questions of visibility and audibility, um, etc., on all levels of life, yeah. And this is does not dictated by authorities, but it's reenacted yeah, in everyday life by lots of people, not by all people. Again, we're talking about simplifications here, but still, this is the, the common, the normal idea, basically. So what we have to ask ourselves now um, is what power can literature actually hold when the exclusionary idea of ethnic nation has determined belonging, when not all bodies are understood as subject, and when so many voices are defined as inatiquous? Um, I highlighted this part here, the way of framing the common sphere of experience, because I think it is the central aspect of the power of literature and its uh, polit uh, politics here. And we can return to Ahmed now, who states that we can think of reading as a meeting between reader and text. In this context, to talk of encounters as constitutive of identity, that which makes a given thing a thing, is to suggest that there is always more than one in the demarcation of the one. There's always a relationship to a reader who is not inside or outside the text in the determination of the text as such. So what we can remember here is the idea of reading as a meeting, reading as an encounter between text and reader. Yeah? I think this is a very important point because in a fair sense, politics can only affect equality when we do not use the established forms of perception to produce strangers. Yeah? So we have to allow for encounters in many ways and reading can be the place to start. Yeah? And we can think of different forms of representation, of inclusion and of dialogue. Um, just brought you some examples. I do not want to dwell on them for a long time. I just wanted to show you such examples. Uh, short fiction here, Roddy Doyle, for instance, um, Donald Ryan, or um, the cover versions of um, the seminal uh, short story collection, Dubliners by James Joyce, and cover versions in Dubliners 100, uh, Emma Donoghue's A Stray that you're familiar with. Yeah, So all these um, writers here, they allow for encounters, yeah? encounters with, um, well, characters usually well, produced as strangers. Yeah? Um, and from short fiction now, I would like to briefly turn to live writing. And again, just to be on the same page, can anybody tell us how we can define live writing? And we're just looking for a very simple definition, a rather broad one. Or maybe you can give us some examples um, of what can count as live writing. So <clears throat> maybe we can, again, simply collect some ideas here. And what is live writing or what could count as live writing? You can also uh, maybe mention some examples if you find that easy. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Um, so in general, uh, live writing is um, a literary genre that deals with um, experiences, emotions. Um, so everything that the author in particular um, experienced in his life. And um, this can be in form of um, biographies, diaries, but also letters. So uh, any kind of testimony that is about life and uh, encounters, experiences, uh, emotions. Uh, so anything connected to that. 
Thank you. So how what experiences, emotions, testimonies? Yeah, great, thank you. And as far as you mentioned, the biography, the diary, the letter. Mm -hmm. Anything else to add here? Any further ideas about what could count as life writing? Or maybe I can ask to our example. So Okori's um so the excerpts from Okori's book and from uh, Emma Donahue's book, do they count as life writing? What do you think? You could make this a very controversial discussion, of course, but maybe you have some rather simple ideas about that. So we haven't talked about uh, a Madonna you or haven't talked that much about the Madonna you. So what is special about her um, short story counting the days, for instance? What's noteworthy about it? Mm -hmm. Yes, please go ahead. So, um, so if I remember correctly, um, she left Ireland for love. And um, this is also what happens in Counting the Days, where the um, wife leaves Ireland to get back to her husband. Um, and it's um, so it's kind of a personal experience that she is um, working through in her historical fiction. So um, it. I would also count it to life writing because it's still um, about human experience. It's a personal experience that she made. Um, it's about uh, the emotions and um, I guess it's, yeah, it's, you can count it to the genre in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So I guess you um, um, talk about the, the afterward to um, Australia, right? So her personal experience as a migrant and she relates her personal experience to the experience of many other migrants. Yeah, she talks about economic migrants, for instance. Yeah, and actually establishes a connection between um, the Irish who left Ireland during the time of the Great Famine. Yeah, so um, remember the quotation by Thornton that I've just showed you. Yeah, so the experience of the Irish migrant has been told over and over again, and she relates this to. Um, well, migration in general, for instance, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, and what about the short story? So what is um, more noteworthy about your short story, about the form of the story, maybe? Do you remember how she actually well, wrote it? Yeah. And she based it on letters that were actually found. So they were real letters that she found and that she used as the letters in the short story as well. And she basically only reconstructed the events surrounding these letters and the thoughts of the people writing them. Yeah, thank you. Right. So she found some letters, yeah. Um, well, not written by any famous people, but uh, just well, by a married couple who wrote these letters to one another um, when the husband had already migrated to Canada and the wife with the children was about to follow him. Yeah. So this is, I think, is a very um, interesting short story because of its hybrid nature, for instance. Yeah, thank you. So um, just have a very well, simple definition, life writing here, and you can see that such writings include autobiography, biography, diaries, um, we have letters, um, yeah, scientific historical writings, and so on and so on. Yeah. And I think Amadoni, um, what well, her short story collection is quite interesting because of the many levels it connects. And so is Okori's This Hostel Life, because of the three different stories that all relate to to journeys, to processes of inclusion, exclusion, community building, and both writers at rather personal essays, yeah, uh, either as an introduction or as an afterword to their collections. And I think this um, has a very interesting effect on the reader. Um, I brought you also some further examples of um, life writing that, well, 
all these examples have rather particular agendas. And for instance, I have here the beginning of um, well, a story or essay. It's actually a mixture of both. Yeah. And it's called Black Baby Box of Box by Philomena Mullen. And again, you can see here the notion of aesthetics, the notion of perception. My sense of reality, she writes, has always been informed by my outstanding racial characteristic, my coffee colored skin, my Africanness, my blackness. It has led me to be viewed differently. I have rarely lived a day in my skin without being pointed out that I'm black. It has to be said that I don't mind being black or even being called black, but I don't want to be busy being black. And I think this last sentence here is very interesting. I met Philomena Mullen a couple of years ago, and I think where I found her a very interesting personality because, um, yeah, it struck me how she actually talked about blackness. And by the way, she's not an immigrant, or not an well, asylum seeker. She was born in Ireland. Yeah, um, she's she was born in the seventies, I think. Yeah, but still, she's always confronted because um, with her blackness because. Um, she's perceived as being other, yeah? and I think her essay is very interesting here. Um, and this is also a very interesting publication uh, titled Yes, We Still Drink Coffee, published by Fighting With Words and Frontline Defenders Publishing. Fighting With Words is um, a campaign that was co-founded um, by Roddy Doyle, yeah? who we've heard about quite often today, yeah? the commitments and also um, the deputies, yeah, the cover that I showed you. And for this publication, Irish-based writers were paired with female human rights defenders, and um, they told these activist stories, mostly in essay form. But here you can see uh, that Milati Uchi Okori interviewed Shisham Osman from Egypt, and together with Rosa Design, she um, actually came up with a comic version of her story. Yeah? So this is also life writing. This is also and this also has a particular agenda, yeah? So um, it also set out to change patterns of thought, to shift perceptions and ideas. And here's another one that I've already showed you, and that's the cover, Voices from Direct Position. This is a series of publications that attempts to offer an inside view of what is what it is like to be forced to live in direct provision. And um, this is just one example. You can see there are letters, handwritten letters, written by people living in direct provision, um, addressed to politicians, for instance. Um, there are personal statements, there are poems, there are photographs. Yeah, so it's a complete compilation of things that, um, yeah, we usually do not see. Yeah, so voices that are usually not audible, uh, people who are usually not visible. Yeah, at the center of society. So it's an attempt to redistribute the sensible, to make people who were not visible before, to make them visible, yeah, to make their voices audible. Okay, um, right. So any questions about these publications or any other things that you would like to add? Okay, okay. so we do not have that much time left. Um, unfortunately, but I would still like to come back to the idea of um, yeah, the encounter via fiction. And in order to be able to, well, at least briefly talk about that, again, I have a question for you, just a second, which I thought somebody placed into the chat. So, just a second. So here's my question for you. So what do you think? How can strange encounters through short fiction and forms of live writing, um, how can they give rise, sorry for the mistake here, how can they give rise to subjectification, recognition, and new communities based on shared experience without concealing differences between forms of displacement? Yeah, so what I want you to do is basically think about how reading text by Okori and Donahue, for instance, can be seen as encounters, yeah? encounters between us as readers and characters or voices that we usually do not see um, in our everyday life. Yeah? I just want to give you, let's say, two minutes yeah, to think about that. 
So you want to take some notes, maybe you want to try to remember what's happening um, on the level of story and discourse or form in the short stories. And then let us simply collect some ideas um, that may provide more food for thought, things that you can reflect on after our workshop. Yeah. So let's say two minutes and then we'll collect some of these. And I'll just add another question that's um, maybe helpful as a starting point for our discussion. What perspective do the stories uh, engender regarding the figure of the stranger or the immigrant? Yeah, so this is more about perspectives. Okay, so let us simply try to collect some ideas again. So thinking about reading as an encounter, uh, what comes to your mind? So feel free to relate to your personal experiences, your personal reading experience. So maybe you can think about how you read the stories, um, how this was an encounter for you, possibly. Whom did you encounter? What ideas, maybe um, anything that you just want to share? Uh, yes, we have a hand here. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, it's helped me realize things about um, Irish immigrant policy as well that I wasn't necessarily that aware of. So I think um, life writing or writing these strange encounters does open the eyes of people um, on subjects that aren't necessary that they aren't necessarily aware of yeah thank you so are you opening well, that's that's the key word maybe thank you uh next is uh eva Shivek. uh strangers are always something unknown and uh we humans are always afraid of the unknown but when we face it in something fictional like a book, it's not that scary to encounter at first. Ah, thank you. Yeah, so as a as a first point of encounter that may not well scare us off and maybe also make us think about um, who that stranger actually is or who we produce as strangers. Who doesn't seem to be well that strange anymore when we read uh, maybe a short story from a particular perspective or. Um, focalization is important here as well, I think. Uh, yeah, Dominic Krauss is next. 
Um, so for my reading experience, um, what I realized is that for all these stories, um, longing and belonging were really central to the experience and uh, for and where they felt they belong uh, didn't align. And so this also made for um, many feelings of being estranged and um, or finding strangers, people who are longing for the same thing in the new world, but uh, don't feel like they belong in the same place. So um, they kind of have these feelings of being estranged from each other also. Yeah, thank you very much. So longing uh, and belonging, or maybe also longing for belonging, right? And we see uh, that they are shared experiences, common experiences, but still, yeah, when we think about Ahmed again, um, we're not all the same strangers, yeah? So uh, Ahmed Anahu, who migrated to Canada because um, uh, she was in love, basically, yeah? She could simply fly to Canada right from there, keep her profession. Of course, she's a different form of a stranger, differently produced, maybe as a stranger, um, in comparison to um, the, the characters uh, in Counting the Days, yeah, who might like during the Great Famine or the asylum seekers in uh, Okori's um, short story collection. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Teresa Keller. Um, I just wanted to add that since um, especially uh, or both of these stories and I personally Find, found the counting the days more a personal connection. Um, I think that life writing really helps um, bonding with the characters since you can, um, since you know it's not just a fictional character, but it has a real basis to it. So I think it's uh, easier to connect with the characters and understand their experience and change the perspective um, when you know that the characters in the story are real or were real kind of. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. So we could actually start a whole new discussion from here talking about fact and fiction, what's real, what's fictional. Yeah, but thank you for sharing these insights. And I think what's also quite interesting is that we have this pairing of live writing of fact and fiction, live writing and short stories, and also how the short stories by Okor and Donnie actually imagine their own readers, yeah? With um, the letters incorporated in Donahue's story or the embedded story in Under the Awning um, where the readers already imagined and yeah, the second person narrator. Right, so there are many more things to explore, but we're running out of time, so, I just want to share my screen for a very last time here, just to wrap up. And um, I'll find it again, just a second. So we do have my presentation. Right. So we um, can just skip that. That were just some ideas that I collected. So just once again, our uh, agenda and aims for today. So we've talked about all these things now. But this workshop could only serve as a very simplified introduction to how short fiction and live writing by migrant writers can change the rules, as Charlotte McIver said. So I hope we were able to take a glimpse at how such rights and writing can attempt to well, descend the problematic whiteness, contribute to more inclusive community building, give rise to recognition, new communities, and so on. Um, so just to wrap up um, the uh, workshop in one minute. I'd like to ask everybody to write a one minute paper by using the chat. Yeah, and my question would be, did you gain any new insights? Did you encounter ideas you want to look into further? Yeah, did we maybe also uh, well, achieve these aims? Yeah, so just please use the chat to write down your reflection, new insights, new ideas you want to reflect on further. Um, one minute from now, and please only hit send when I tell you to do so, okay? So that's our wrap up done. So just one minute from now.
Okay, so please simply finish your sentence and then please uh, hit send um, send your post your contribution to the chat now. Right, I can see lots of um, yeah comments coming in. So I don't know, can we maybe um, uh, save the chat? Um, I can make my presentation available maybe for everybody who's interested. And maybe then we'll also have the reflections. Um, I'd love to read through that uh, later today. So um, I can see that many of you write there were interesting insights. Um, yeah, perspectives on immigration, emigration, the dynamics of strangers, uh, the concepts of that takes right. So thank you very much for your reflection, for your feedback. Thank you very much for your participation and attention. I really hope that you take something home that you reflect on some of these things. And yeah, right. Thank you very much for your attention, participation, and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Boller, for this workshop. I, I think it, it held many insights for, um, you know, the, the heterogeneous group that we are. We have, you know, students who are at the very beginnings of their studies and quite advanced master's students here. And we, we also have a number of uh, university teachers and school teachers here. And I think it held um, everything new, uh, or for, for everyone, it held something new, I think. And it was quite exciting for that reason. So thank you very much. And I'd, I'd like to urge people who, you know, wrote their remarks in the chat now, will send around an email, some of you know that already, uh, asking about um, a testimonial, basically your response to this workshop. How, how did you like it? Maybe keep in mind what you just put into the chat and send it to us um, uh, so that we can use it on our website where we publicize the responses to our events. Um, I'd like to make use of um, this uh, online stage here um, to um, publicize uh, another event and invite you to another event. Uh, we'll have a last uh, event on January 24th. Um, Maurice Fitzpatrick, who's currently the traveling visiting professor in Irish studies at the U University of Tübingen, who's also a filmmaker, uh, will talk about Seamus Dean on February 24th. You can find all the information on the Irish Studies Woodsbrook website. And we would be very happy to welcome you for uh, this last event of the winter term. Thank you very much for your attendance today and see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.